Hey guys, welcome to Moving On TV. And today I'm really, really excited because I'm going to be interviewing someone. And his father is probably the most famous person that I've met in my life. And I got to interview for about one minute, I think, in the Freedom Rally on the 29th of August. Um, so this man that I'm going to be interviewing now is a musician and a freedom fighter. And he grew up as the son of the man who told us everything that is actually happening now, who started to talk about this, oh, probably in the 80s and became the laughing stock of society. He used to be a footballer and uh, called himself the son of God. Well, because we are all children of God and obviously a starseed a very, very exceptional um, star seed that came to the planet to warn us about what is actually happening now and what we're living in. So I am so excited. I am so excited to be interviewing Gareth. Gareth, the son of David Icke. <laughs> now, Gareth Icke is an um, incredibly talented musician in his own right. And also a freedom fighter who is standing up and is doing all these speeches also to help us eradicate the system and to find something better for all of us. So I'm going to ask him about how was it to grow up as the son of David Icke and anything else that comes into my mind. So hopefully it's going to flow beautifully and I want you to enjoy this incredible interview and come on moving on tv please subscribe share and like take care and uh let's invite gareth on so hi gareth welcome to the lauren hope glory show and it's wonderful to have you here on moving on tv so where are you what are you up to today okay so hi gareth hey how you doing cool to see you it's it's an absolutely beautiful day here in the uk uh where are you at the moment I'm in Derby, and it's it's not that nice here. Actually, it's a bit grotty in Derby, but I think oh, it's okay. I think it's I think it's probably grotty in Derby quite a lot, if I'm honest. <laughs> Do you know what you? Rem I, I remember Derby very well because I remember going there. I auditioned for a show years and years ago, and I used to drive. I'm from High Wycombe, and I used to drive down there and do the rehearsals. It was the show about Jews because I'm I'm actually Jewish. Okay. An Irish Jew that grew up in Israel. So, you know, crazy, crazy life. A star seed that was in the Israeli army. And um, I remember driving down to Derby and doing this show about the Ladino Jews. And uh, I had this character called the Biggest Mama in it. I don't think it ever got anywhere. <laughs> whereabouts, whereabouts in Derby? Whereabouts in Derby were you performing? Um, well, we performed in London, but I remember I, we used to rehearse in this pub. I can't remember. It was like um, we were given a free room to rehearse in. I swear to God, I can't remember. It was, it was called Anne and Rose. That's it. Anne and Rose. I mean, you've taken me back now. And I remember there was this beautiful, beautiful B&B I stayed at. And it was in nature. And you'd ha you had to drive away from it in order to get to it absolutely gorgeous but there you go so <laughs> it's really exciting to have you here today and it's a pleasure yeah it's lovely so what are you doing there at the moment are you doing are you part of the COVID truth tour 
Um, I, I'm not. No, I'm. I'm doing bits and bobs on the on the tours, but I've got a little one, and she's only two. So, um, obviously, I've you know my responsibilities are there. Um, so when there's you know a protest near enough to me that I can get to, then I'll do it. Um, okay. But yeah, unfortunately, those those touring days of being in the back of a bus going around the country are are long gone. Um, although it would have been <laughs> fun, I'm sure. Do you know what? The only thing I can, I've never did that, but I can identify with you with doing the fringes. I did all the fringes in 2014 to 2016. Oh, it was amazing. We drove all the way to Edinburgh, sang on the streets, sold it out everywhere. And then I got, I, I sold it out. I have five star reviews and I was talking about mental health recovery without medication, doing the breakdowns. And then I got to um, the media and that was it. No one would put me on. So let, let's kind of flow with that a little bit. How did you feel with that? I mean, you're an artist, you're a performer, you're a musician. And um, did you actually try to get on the mainstream to get your talents out there? I mean, how did you feel about that? Um, well, I did, I'm a bit old school in that sense. I, I, I did it the old school way. So... Um, Growing up on the Isle of Wight, there was lots and lots of bands there, loads and loads of bands, um, because basically there's nothing else to do, if I'm honest. Um, you know, the summer's great, sit on the beach all day, but then when the winter comes, everything shuts down and it's just a bit grotty, really. So there was loads and loads of bands, so we just toured. We just lived in the back of a van and, and just went around the country and did it that way and kind of got picked up quite, quite, like, it was quite odd, really. Like, there were places that we seemed to go down really well in. Um, you know, London, we did all right. But there'd be places like in like Chester where you just have like massive audiences and like people would get really into what you were doing. And then you might play another couple of cities after that and it'd be a bit kind of, yeah, you know, we're struggling to get sort of 30, 40 people in the door here. And then, and then you'd end up at another place where you had like these kind of hubs just seem to build like Lincoln, like dead random, but Lincoln, you were always guaranteed a couple of hundred people at a gig there. It was just dead weird, but... So we just did it organically, um, and so we'd get picked up sometimes by the mainstream, but um, yeah, generally they weren't really interested, if I'm honest. Um, when I went solo, I did um, bits and bobs, you know, on you know Radio 2 and Kerrang! and things like that, um, which I guess you'd consider mainstream, but yeah, apart from that, it didn't really touch me, if I'm honest. Yeah. It, it was a weird one. Yeah, they, they, they kind of, I got pigeonholed really with the surname, so um yeah. For, for all the people that you'd get through the door just out of sort of almost morbid curiosity, um, you'd get the same amount, if not more people, would just just discard you. It's all that's that, yeah. Mm. Right. You know, so, yeah, I don't know. But I, I didn't do it for them anyway. I did it because I love doing it, so I'm not really bothered, if I'm honest. Of course you did. Um, it's one of them, yeah. You're a real, true musician. <laughs> yeah, I just love playing. And, um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, obviously that's, you know, that's dead at the minute. And, um you know, I've got a lot of friends that are really, really, really struggling. Like they've not worked in six months and they're probably not going to work in another six months, um, if not more, you know. So um, they're doing like online live stream gigs and stuff. And I did a couple, but it's not the same. It's not like yeah. looking in the whites of the eyes of the audience and stuff. So I've, I've just, I knocked yeah. that on the head because I wasn't enjoying it. So yeah. I didn't see the point really, one of them. And I know where you're coming from. Um, I started my musical career at 60 years old in Dublin, playing the accordion. And then when I was 13 in Israel, I became the lead soloist of the Children's National Choir. And to be in front of real audiences, as I say, I've been since, since I was six. So how old were you when you started performing? Um, well, if you ask my parents, I, I was performing when I came out of the womb, if I'm honest. Um, <laughs> one of them ones. But in terms of music, I didn't get into music till later. I think it was like 18, 19 when I got my first guitar. Um, I, was a, I was a footballer before that. So that's what, you know, that's what I was doing. So, um, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't really, I was a bit of a latecomer. Like I loved music, you know, like when I was 15, 16, I had like blonde hair down here thinking I was Kurt Cobain, but mm -hmm. I, um, but I didn't play, I didn't play in bands. I was just happy to go and follow bands around and watch them. But yeah, a bit of a latecomer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. So you were actually a footballer, like your father. Yeah, yeah but, as a footballer. Yeah, well, it's a family thing. So my brother did the same. Um, I was at Portsmouth um, Football Club, and my my brother ended up. He was at Man United for a bit, and then he ended up down at Portsmouth as well. Um, obviously, with us being you know on the Isle of Wight at the time, it made sense to be on the south coast. So, yeah, but um, 
kind of injuries, things like that, also just fallen out of love with it, if I'm honest. I didn't, it didn't really, it didn't fulfill me enough. And then I went into beach soccer later on. I played for England for five years, at beach soccer. So I got, that was different because I got to tour the world. You know, I, I, I went and played in places. I played in Israel, actually. I played in Netanya. Um, but I, I played, but that's where they're from, is it? Yeah, I that's my dad was yeah in Netanya. Yeah, we, we we played against Israel there, um, and then like other places that were just dead random, like Azerbaijan. Like you're never gonna go to Azerbaijan on holiday, but I got to go there and play beach soccer and 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 stuff. And I played up in the Alps, like in the French Alps. They imported loads of sand up there. It was just in the ski resort. It was just like crazy time. So even though football didn't fulfil me, you know, it meant I got to travel and see and do things that I'd never get to do. So I was very privileged okay. in that sense. Okay. Wow. So to whoever is watching this and they don't know, Gareth is actually David Ike's son. And very interestingly enough, they used to call, they call your dad the son of God. They used to call him the son of God and they used to make a lot of fun of him a lot of the time. And um, to me, the son of God, we're all children of God anyway. So how was it to grow up with David Ike? I mean, how was it to grow up with someone that was so controversial, did he? I mean, you, obviously, you now go out and you're doing the talks. You're all part of this new revolution, this new awakening. So how, do, how, how did that happen? How did you get involved with it? Did your dad kind of educate you into it? Just talk about how it was to grow up with David Icke. Um, well, it's a weird one, really, because I get asked that question a lot. Like, you know, what was it like? And it's like, well... I've got nothing to compare it to because it's like, for me, it's normal. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, I've, I've not, I've not been someone else's lad for a bit. And then I, you know, so it's kind of, um, I mean, I remember, you know, he was at the BBC dead famous. Everyone loved him. You know, you get stopped in the street constantly. Obviously these are days before, um, you know, mobile phone cameras and stuff like that, but people would always want to talk to him. And then, you know, in what felt like about a 20 minute period, it went from that to suddenly everyone shouting abuse, which as a kid, cause I was only young. Um, How old were you Gareth? uh god how old am i eight eight maybe yeah. something like that so um that yeah it was just a bit weird didn't really understand what that was all about and then i was getting sort of followed to school by reporters um waiting outside school gates for me and stuff which i've always found even to this day i find odd because i don't know what relevance i had as an eight nine year old kid but you know there you go that's the press yeah. um so that was odd um but then but what it taught me you know like people used to shout son of god at me and that that i always found that odd because surely i'd be the grandson wouldn't i do you know what i mean but there you go <laughs> But um, <laughs> but he kind of taught me to not really be bothered about what other people thought, and I and like I know everyone says that I don't care what people think, and then when you actually sort of you know dig beneath the surface a little bit, they definitely care what everyone thinks. Um, but having that sort of you know beaten uh, like any any sort of ego or or kind of you know self preservation say um, was just beaten out of you um so now i kind of i think that for everything a reason like that's given me an unbelievable freedom in my adult life now like i can stand up and say what i believe to be right without any fear of repercussions because well what they're going to do do you know what i mean shout abuse at me well i've been there sure. mate. not bothered do you know what i mean so as but, a kid what i mean did you turn did your friends turn against you was there bullying or anything like that that you had uh, yeah, I got, I got. My friends didn't turn against me. Friends were great, but I got a bit of stick. Um, but I think, I think everyone does. Do you know what I mean? I think mine was just yeah. a little, was a bit different. And also, to be fair, like I'd had, I had a bone wasting disease when I was a kid, um, which is what then in the end sort of meant that the football stuff was out the window. But I, um, so I kind of, you know, I was in a wheelchair at school at the beginning. So I started school in a wheelchair. So I kind of, I started at the bottom in terms of you know any kind of like social hierarchy of getting ear roll grief so again it didn't really bother me it kind of is what it is um mm. and like i said i think everyone gets bullied i think everyone gets a bit of stuff at school for whatever reason you know maybe are your ears mm. too big or are you too short or are you too tall are you too thin are you too fat you know kids are cruel um what got me though and i, I think about this now now i've got a little and like all the stuff with my dad was on like adult tv it was on nighttime tv all the wogan stuff so no kids were sat watching that certainly not primary school kids so for those kids to then come in and give me grief they must have been told that by their parents and i i can't really get my head around that so like if my little one's going to school 
and I know that, you know, one of the kids in the class, his dad has, has you know, had some grief on TV. The idea that I would tell a Laura, oh, yeah, you know that girl, Susie, in your class? Yeah, her dad's a lunatic. Yeah, you should tell her that her dad's a lunatic. It's, it's odd parenting. And I've always, even like, even now at 38, I look back at that and I think, what were they thinking? Like, what were those parents doing? Because that's just weird. Like, kids are cruel, granted, but yeah. they only knew the stuff because their parents told them about it. So I've, I've all, mm -hmm. you know, that's weird to me. I find that odd, but... But, you know, what right. doesn't kill you? It's one of them. Did you also get situations that, you know, where parents wouldn't actually send their, uh, their children to the house and kept them away afterwards as well? Because not that, no, not that I'm aware of. They, no. might well, they might well have done, but I never heard that. And I, and I know um, that the media came down and they were offering money to friends of mine's parents um to say stuff negative about the family and and whatever and um they all, all all of them turned it down there's one family in particular who i actually thought i didn't think the dad liked me very much to be honest which you know i wouldn't blame him was probably a bit of a toe rag but um they didn't have any money like they really didn't have any money as a family and um and they were offered a few quid it was by the daily mirror or the sun one of them you know red top right. and they and they, they turned it down and um you know that's even like say even now 30 years later i still look at them fondly as you know that would have been difficult for them to turn down money actually because they didn't have any money so um you know but we had the same we went on holiday to crete um during this whole horror show and again i didn't really know what was going on i was a young kid I got salmonella food poisoning that's great fun if anyone's ever had that jesus no. but um but um we were eating in this little taverna and it was a docile i think it's basically where i got salmonella if i'm honest but but the, but the reason we were there was because if you went to any of the nicer places you know where the tourists were um you know you had no chance because it was full of british tourists so you get all kinds of grief and we were the family were front page news at the time back in in england so um so we ended up going to this little taverna um you know out off the beaten track and and someone again from the mainstream media had got wind of where we were going and they offered the guy that ran the taverna um, money to say stuff, money to tell us, uh, to tell them when we were going there, when we were booking a table, when where we were staying, mm -hmm. and um, and again he refused. This Greek guy, lovely bloke, turned it down, and um, you know it was a lot of money they were offering, and and yeah. he didn't he didn't have a lot of money, you know that it was a tiny little taverna off the beaten track, so he wouldn't have made any money. But so for all the nastiness, you know, um, you've got some real nice souls out there as well, and some really good humanity that that you kind of witness. So just to balance yeah. it you know it wasn't all negative well like you say i mean the ages of seven and eight are so important you know i was taken from dublin a really safe easy beautiful country to israel <laughs> you know what i mean continuous wars and terrorism and childhood abuse everything i went through everything and you're, you're, you know, you're so impressionable at that age. And there's a part of me that if I had a magic wand, I would, have, I would go back to Ireland now, even though I know that everything that happened to me, Gareth, made me into the person that I am now, the freedom fighter. You know, if I hadn't gone through all of that, I'd be hiding behind the couch now, wearing a shield and watching the MSM. So do you, do you ever feel that? Do you ever feel that wouldn't it have been great if dad never did this, if he just stayed that, inc that, that footballer that he was, where he was getting all this um, praise and positivity, and when suddenly it was like, no, your father's a lunatic. So do you, do you, do you ever feel that you would like to maybe turn the clock back and do it again? No, no chance. No Nothing. chance. No, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't believe in anything like that. Um, you know, I, I was married once when I was younger and, you know, it was a horror show. Um, and so, you know, I'm married now to my wife. We have a child together. We have a house together and stuff like that. And, you know, part of me thought in the past, you know, wouldn't it have been nice to have gone back and just got rid of that? So, I, you know, but it's like, no, because that's what led me to where I am. Um, if I hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have met my current wife. I, we wouldn't have had a Laura. We wouldn't. Do you know what I mean? Because things would have been different. And then, so I think, um, I think you, you are where you're meant to be and it's how you deal with it and how you react to it. And I, I, I kind of like, I've always had this opinion that we, we sort of, we choose our lives anyway. Like we've chosen it before, um, you know, before we get here, which I know might sound a bit sort of out there to some people, but you know, 
I don't really care. <laughs> it's how I think. So yeah. I, I kind of feel like I chose this. Like I chose to be here at this time. I chose to be his lad. Um, I chose to be Alora's dad. And I chose this path because it's what I'm meant to be doing um, for whatever reason. And, you know, I'll, I will carry on it, carry it on through till the end because that's what I'm meant to be doing. So no, don't, don't believe in regrets. I don't, I don't believe in things I can't change if I'm honest with you because I think you're you're on to a losing battle then mm. you know I, I find that like if someone says to me like if they're down about something it's kind of well what is it and what can you do about it well nothing forget it mm. I mean, mm. forget it can't do anything about yeah. it so we just change something that you can change mm. yeah no I, I totally agree there um, uh, I can't say that I believe 100% but then when I see the way my life has gone and the kind of people I've been hurt by everyone. <laughs> I mean, my whole family cut me off when my father died and I've had friends that have turned against me. And particularly in this situation, I even I'm separated from my husband. So much has changed through all of this, but it, it's a bit like we're being molded in some way. You know, um, as I say, people like me, are drowning in medication. They're drowning in medication. And there's me. I get through every single crisis just by doing all the techniques and meditation and doing what I'm doing here. And I, I do believe you, you know, I do believe that to, to a certain extent, we are made, we've got to be really strong now, let's face it. I mean, we're standing up there and we're negating we're negating something that up, we're coming up to 50%. And I do believe this, that at some point we will be. But we're got, we've been going out there for years, like you and me. I've been going out with Big Pharma for years and years and years, um, trying to convince family, friends, and sex trafficking. And people would just say, oh, I don't want to talk about it. Don't want to talk about it. And you've got to be a certain kind of person to be able to empathize about the pain of the world. And you've also got to be a certain kind of person to be able to deal with all of this pain that the world throws at you, all these people that, are, but they're teaching you. Those that have hurt me the most are the biggest teachers. They're the greatest teachers. And, and I think that's what's led us to being able to stand up there tall and Really, really stick with what we believe in, Gareth. I mean, because come on, it's all, it comes at you all over the place trying to say to you, you're a lunatic, you're mad, you're killing people. I've, I've had this on Facebook calling me God knows what kind of names when I'm standing tall and saying, you've got to get back together. That You know, this is, a, this is not what you think it is. And giving evidence and you get called everything on this planet. So you're doing, you're doing talks at the moment, are you, as well? Are yeah, bit, yeah, bits and bobs. To your dads. It's, it's a real like, interesting point you've made there. Like, I, I, I'm, I completely agree. Like, you win some, you learn some. That's sort of my attitude as well. And like, you know, you're saying that you know, you've been through all this stuff and this is why you're here and this is why you stood strong and firm. And I think that's, that's the point, I think it's damaged people that are the ones standing up because they've got the courage to do it because they've been, they've been through stuff. And so then that goes back to your previous question, you know, like, would I have liked to have put back time so that dad was just a footballer? Well, no, because I wouldn't be prepared for this. You know, I'd have had a cushy yeah. life and you, and you wouldn't be prepared for stuff like that. Um, that's happening now. And, um, you know, when I look around at the people that are speaking up and fighting, they are, they are warriors, but they're only warriors because, yeah they've had to be in the past, mm, mm. you know, the, but the one person I don't want to fight is someone that's, you know, got a lot of experience in fighting. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what I mean? You know, and that's, you know, that's who's standing up now and we, we have to stand up. We have to, and it's, it's not pretty. And I've, I've lost plenty of friends over the last six months, but the way I look at it is they served a purpose in my life for a while. And I served a purpose in their life for a while. And, you know, we'll have a sort of metaphorical handshake and bid farewell and I'll carry yeah. on my path and they carry on theirs. And, you know, you never know, they might just come back and we might meet again in, in 20 years, 30 years, two months, whatever. Um, but if not, then we carry on. Yeah. Um, do you have brothers or sisters? I mean, I'm not sure. Do you have any siblings at all? Yeah, I've got, I've got an older sister 
Kerry, she's down on the Isle of Wight. Um, right. And then I've got a younger brother, Jay, who lives up here with, with me up in Derbyshire. Um, and he runs yeah. Iconic. He runs Iconic, the network. So, um, so yeah, we, so we do stuff for that together. Oh, brilliant. So you, you all basically were brought up on the same teaching. So did ever, was everyone happy about that? Or were any of you, I know you're saying that you were happy about all of the way the way that you were brought up by your dad but what about your siblings Did they have any was there any contradictions or anything at all how did they feel about it no i think they're okay i think they you know in the same way as me like we went through the same sort of you know ridicule and all that sort of stuff so you know that's never i'm gonna sneeze a minute <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. <laughs> is, 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 is sneezing a symptom of COVID? It's hard to keep yes, up. Yes, it is. <laughs> might be, might not. No. She get, she get tested. No, there's no, we've got, there's no colds. There's no hay fever. There's no bronchitis. There's no, there's no nothing now. It's only COVID, as we know. It's All right. That's, but carry on. Carry that's on. annoying. That's annoying. I've, I've, I've sneezed my way into a deadly virus on a, on a podcast. That's. Uh, I never thought that would be how I'd go. But there you go. <laughs> it's lucky you're on here and not on some mainstream because. You know, oh yeah, someone would be kicking the door right now and they cut me off. Yeah. <laughs> but no, my my, my brothers. <laughs> My brothers sound like in that sense, and my my sisters sound like we're we're very different people. Um, the three of us, um, my brother and and my sister are very much sort of behind the camera kind of kind of people. Like my brother in particular, you know, he runs iconic. He doesn't want to be in front of the camera. It's not his thing because um, he's he's been asked to speak at a couple of events as well, and it's really it's not his thing. Whereas obviously I'm a bit more of a big mouth and obviously I've like yourself you know years of performing you know uh, musically and stuff like that so that gives you that little bit of experience of it standing does. up in front of people yeah, yeah which you know it is nerve-wracking as well like I must admit when I when I spoke in Birmingham that's the first time I've ever spoke publicly like I've played in front of like tons of people all over the world musically mm -hmm. and football mm -hmm. um, but to stand up there and speak and I don't know how many people there were in, in Birmingham probably a thousand something like that um, to just get handed a microphone and then just talk with that many people looking at you listening. It is, it is nerve wracking. I must admit. Yeah. And I, you know, I went a bit the old shaking Stevens on the legs. Um, but the more experience I get at it, um, and the, I've just decided as well to just do away with notes. Like I had these notes and as I was just like my dad said, but you know what you're going to say? And I was like, yeah, I don't need notes. Chuck them. Um, cause I'm speaking from the heart and you know, I, I don't have to remember things cause I believe them. If that makes any sense. Do you know what I mean? Yes. I don't have to try and remember yes. stuff. It's like, no, just say what you feel and it what you streams th out of you. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and that's what I did in, in Sheffield. It was the first time I just chucked the notes. I was like, I don't need them. I know what I'm saying. And, um, and just stood there and spoke and it was fine. So mm. yeah, I feel like I'm learning. Brilliant. Learn how to do it, yeah. Brilliant. I've got an edge over you there because I'm an actress. <laughs> and, and you know, when I went out with the acting, it, the first, as soon as I would finish doing the, the life story, you must know Edith Piaf, the French singer. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And Maria Callas, they all, well, she had serious mental illness and depression and all sorts. Both of them did, and I do both of them, both their life stories. I've been very lucky to have a voice that is adaptable to both the really high notes and the really low notes. But the beauty of it is that at the end of the show, moving on theatre is very specialised in the way that it's all about mental health recovery without medication. And uh, as I said, the therapeutic communities. I've even written a whole musical called Encounters based on mental health recovery with compassion and love. And so anyway, to cut a long story short, when I stood, st once I do the show, I do these massive breakdowns, crying, screaming, laughing, doing literally the institution and everything. I come out in front of the audience and I say, there you go. You saw what they went through, their depressions and their breakdowns. Look at me. Look at me. I, I'm running a theatre company, me, with a serious mental illness. And I haven't fallen out with anyone. We all live together in Edinburgh. And, and it, it's, it's given me the edge. So I just stand there. And it's, it, as you know, once you've done your singing or, or you've done the show, you've connected to spirit. It's a really good way to open up. And, and that's probably why, was it Noel Gallagher who just stood up and said, I'm not wearing a mask? And he's just telling them where to go. I think, 
a lot of entertainers, a lot of artists like ourselves, because our music makes us go inside. It makes us connect to spirit and it opens the heart chakra. It opens everything, doesn't it? It's easy for us to understand that this world this is not what it seems to be. And also because we get the hard knots, you know, where we, do, we basically live from one day to another, you know, as we're usually not earning anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. What we love, <laughs> we do what we love. So we're able to see what's wrong with the system. We're able to see what's wrong with society. But I want to talk to you about God, at the, the concept of God, because I'm Jewish. Um, I was brought up Jewish, but I never believed in it. I never could believe in it. I couldn't believe in a religion that told me that thank you God for making me the golden child that suffers because that's what was in the scriptures from when I went to synagogue. But one thing I'm very grateful for being Jewish is the fact that I was brought up on the Holocaust. Now, without going into how it happened and what happened, we all know now how, how it all happened, how, how the deep state created everything. But it gave me an edge. And as soon as this lockdown happened, I, I knew, oh my God, we're living in 1930s Germany, but we're awake. We're awake. So we don't have to go to the gas chambers, so to speak. We can stop it now. So, so my concept of God uh, is, is not a religion. I believe we're all the same. Muslim, Jews, Christians, we we're, we're all just had that stamp put on us or a soul journey. And we are all connected. But to me, God is love. I've studied the Course in Miracles and the teachings of Jesus. So God is love. And it's inside of me. It's the thing that after I have a breakdown, and I do have them, I suppose lots of us do when we're crying and screaming and letting it all out because of the way the world is. And then I, go, I come back on and I do an interview with someone else. And I carry on sending out that message. It's inside of me. And, and what they've done to us is, is so bad because they disconnected us from each other. And we are supposed to be connected because the more connected we are, the more our love, God, grows. And they can't touch us then. So anyway, that, that's my side of it. What's your concept of God? No, I, I'm with you, I think. Yeah, I think we're all one. Absolutely. Um, and I think those kind of, you know, religions are just another fault line. There's loads of fault lines that people put in, in society um, that are more kind of more obvious now, um, even during the last six months. The divide amongst population has become more and more insane. Um, what people are divided by. I mean, the whole pandemic's become partisan in some way. Like if you're, if, if you're, if you're, if you're left leaning, um, you know, and you're into socialism, you're probably going to be wet in the bed over all this, which I, I, I've found really odd. Um, and then if you're right leaning, then you're less like, it's just, it's quite odd. I, the whole dynamic's quite bizarre, but yeah, when it comes to God, I, I kind of, I believe in something. I've always believed in something. I don't believe in like a guy in a beard on a cloud. Um, but I think that I belong and you belong as part of something bigger than we are. Um, and, obviously religions are just kind of, they seem to be telling the same story anyway, really. If you, if you if kind of skip away the little bits and just go to the core of all of the major religions, they're all telling the same story anyway. Um, and like you said, actually, it was interesting. You say like the, the religions are just a label that are put on people. Um, it is funny how you have two Christian parents that just happen to have a Christian child, you know, like that, what are the odds? Um, cause there's no free will gone into it. Do you know what I mean? It's the same. You've got two Muslim parents and the, the child's, child's come out Muslim. Wow. What are the chances of that? Um, you know, it's, it's the labels are being given to people. Um, and you know, it's not free will. It's not what they want to do, um, organically and naturally. So, so I'm not, I'm not pro any religion at all. Um, but I do believe in something. I just don't know what it is, but I'll, I'll find out when I get there. That's my okay. thing. I, d I don't mind not knowing. And I kind of quite like, living by some kind of 10 commandment as well. Cause if you break down, I think it was George Carlin broke down the, the 10 commandments to one, which was do not steal. And that's all it is basically. Um, whereas I'd look at the 10 commandments as basically just don't be an idiot. Don't be, don't be a dickhead. Don't be horrible. 
mm-hmm. and that's just the one in it because if you're if you're stealing your mate's wife that's pretty horrible if you're killing people that's pretty horrible mm. um so they're all just don't be horrible so if you live by that commandment then that's fine and then when i get there i'll either be worm food or i'll be on a cloud <laughs> with jim morrison or whatever i'll find <laughs> out when i get there you know, now I, jim morrison is he one of your influences oh i love jim morrison he's just incredible is he one of your influences you mean no not 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 musically no but i just kind of i like characters i'm a big fan of characters generally and and like for me with football's one because i love football um there's no characters in football anymore so now like you'd have your Brian Clough and people like that. They were, they were, they were char- I suppose Jose Mourinho, or Jose, whatever, Mourinho is probably the only character left. You know where you just, someone that you just, they're a loose cannon and you don't know what they're going to say from one minute to the next. And they're kind of, they're not in society anymore, which I think is sad. Yeah. But Jim Morrison was one of them. And, you know, John Lennon was one of them. So, Sid Vicious. So, someone who was just going to say something that yeah. everyone's going to go, whoa, did you see that? Yeah. Oh my God. Wow. That was amazing. That, and those, the, those people are now just kind of, yeah, they don't really exist. They're sort of, we've, it's just become quite vanilla X factor. Mm. Yes, sir. Puppets. No, sir. Puppets. puppets. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you will you know, footballers are the same, like, you know, what they can and can't say on their Twitter accounts. Should be able to say what they want. Like that's the whole point of it. Yes. But, yeah. You know, but they use this great line now and I see it all the time, but they're a role model. Well, who says, who says they're a role model and for who? You know, he's just a musician or he's just a footballer. He's not my role model. He shouldn't be anyone's role model. He should be able to say what he wants or what she wants. But Yeah, it's yeah. very unfortunate the way the whole celebrity culture went. I'll never forget the time that I had finished Edinburgh, with, as I say, with five-star reviews. And that was the first time I've ever done anything like that on my own, more or less, sold out. And I went to Loose Women. I thought, oh, they love me. They're going to put me on because I'm running this with a serious mental illness, you know, doing it. Did you know they said to me, oh, we can't put you on because we have to have people like Katie Price. And I I just wanted to strangle that person because you're not going to draw an audience. And to me, that was like, you know, soul destroying. But then it led me to starting moving on TV, as I said, because... I understood that we, you know, everyone is unique and everyone deserves an opportunity in life. But that's how the media went. I, I watched the deterioration of the media. I used to be able to sit there and watch the things like I used to love the Waltons, you know, the Waltons was my favorite program. I wanted to be one of them. And I always wanted to see programs like that, you know, like family programs Bit by bit, it started to be even home and away and all the soaps. Suddenly, everyone was getting sick with cancer and they were all going into hospital, getting chemo and everything. And and then there was violence and God knows what. It was continuous violence and lawyers and doctors and nothing else. There was nothing else on the media. And of course, too much sex and bad language. And I thought, this is... I just saw the the deterioration and I thought I'll start moving on TV because I'm going to not have any of of that. It's only respect and compassion and making everyone feel special and unique. But um, I want to go into another subject with you, which is concerning me quite a lot at the moment. And I want to ask your opinion because I'm all about solutions, Gareth. I'm, I don't like the problem and I'm fed up when people send me, they keep sending me the problem and I know the problem. I know how bad it is. You know, I've done my research. I know what your dad has said. And for a long time, I didn't buy into the reptilians, but then it kind of clicked into place because I thought whoever is doing this, it's not possible that they're human. It's impossible that a human being could do what they're doing because we have compassion, we have empathy, we have love, particularly for children. And so where am I going with this? So I, I'm all about solutions. So when people send me the negative all the time and it's continuous, it's like you're going around in a loop. And I'm also a trained life coach and I believe in solutions. So one of the things is that I'm asking these groups that are forming just seem a lot of them are just going around in circles with the problem and it's so destroying and it's draining freedom fighters like myself 
and a lot of people are falling out. So let's get to the question. <laughs> let's get to what I wanted to say here. I've noticed lately that they are falling out. Like um, so a lot of people are not going to the 19th and some going to the 26th. Dr. Adil has fallen out with Katie and Riani. Mark Steele fall, is falling out with Geza. Now they're saying that Pierce Corbin is, is government planted. And it, this is not good for the image that we're trying to present because the public are going, those, that part of the public that wants to see us fall, that believes the government, they're, they're going to celebrate because we've got to stay united. We've got to stay united. Do you know what I'm talking about here? Because oh yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Hey, it's not yeah. good. No, what it's are you just. What do about it, Garrett? It's it's always been the same though. It's it's. <laughs> there's also there is a lot of, you know, and I understand not trusting government. And I understand question everything and things like that. But there's like there's an unbelievable level of paranoia among the truth movement, and I've always found that. Like the other day. Um, a uh, day before yesterday I had some guy and I'd gone through his timeline and like he's saying exactly the same things that we're saying in terms of the pandemic and about the government response so we're absolutely on the same page bang 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 yeah okay but but he said these <laughs> yeah he said I was a freemason my dad was a freemason my dad is is a female to male uh, trans so oh. I went so I went right so is, is he my dad or my mum then because I'm confused now um and and it was just but he, he wasn't on the wind up either it was like genuine like paranoia and and you're just like what world are you living in mate but that sort of that kind of thing then you know infiltrates into groups so then also oh we don't trust peers or we don't trust yeah. Kate we don't trust Mark and instead of going right well we've all been at these protests together we're all in this together let's do this i mean as for the 19th like i can't do the 19th neither can my dad because dad's got his live stream on the 19th which i'm filming with him and that's been booked for months so we couldn't make the 19th so when we were asked about the two events i was like well we'll support both of them obviously you know good luck to everyone on the 19th i hope it's an absolute like hundred thousand people turn up um but we'll be at the 26th because that's the only one we can go to you know um and i think you know people should support both and that there is a little bit of a kind of attitude that, well, if people go to the 19th, that should split, that will split the numbers. But I don't think it should do. I don't think it should. Like, I've been to rallies in London two weeks in a row, one where there was like 50,000. And then we went right, we're doing it again next week, and there was 100,000. Mm. Um, so, you know, you can grow stuff like on the weekly. Um, so I, I don't see why we can't have two protests. For me, there should be one every week until this nonsense is over. We should be having them every day, but locally in our own cities and our own towns. Because, I mean, as I say, I live in Buckinghamshire. Oh, I live, I live in a village where, you know, <laughs> I just want to hide. It's like Stepford. Stepford, you know, the prisoner. I'm not a number. Uh, we, there was a program called The Prisoner. Right. Ask your dad. <laughs> where, where, whereabouts in Buckinghamshire are you? I, I, I grew up for a bit i think a year in buckinghamshire before i can remember okay. but i'm right by high wickham oh okay okay there's yeah children's um but there's nothing there's absolutely nothing there's and i've seen the list of all these uh speeches and talks and tours and they're all covering mainly the north and they go all the way to scotland they go to cornwall i think there's one in oxford so i thought you know what i'm going to do one I'm going to do one in Berkshire in Marlow because um, we have a Sunday where a lot of people come together. Truthers come together. And uh, so I'm going to stand up. I'm going to sing. I'm going to kind of warm the public up. Now, I was going to say that you could do this. You could do this. And if you're saying you're not performing, so just go out there like Edith Piaf, get a cap, <laughs> do your performing in order to warm them up. Because a great way, you know, one of the things about Piaf is she used to go into the audience and she did Milord. She'd dance with them. She'd sing to them. And she would connect what we're talking about. We have an advantage over anyone because we can break down. Music breaks down every single barrier. And so what I intend to do, I'm going to say you can do it. Anyone can do it is just just do what you're good at and then get a cap out and ask for donations. You know, because I don't know about you, I'm not earning anything. 
But I think it's a good way to bring people together. And, and I know that a lot of people are starting to understand there's something wrong. So as a musician, I think we can go out there because you're talented and talent melts hearts. People really love talent. And if you go out there and you can, as you said, connect to them with your eyes, really draw them in, you're likely to wake up a few people just by doing what you love. And, you know, I think it's a great idea. And, and I've been looking forward to going out and speaking and touring for God knows how long. And now it's here. We need to go out there and create our own. So I'm thinking everyone should be doing it in the local area, literally every day, every couple of days. Just get your boom box, get your microphone, get into a park, get a few leaflets, and I'll film it on Moving On TV. And just, that's it. I think that's a good way to wake up people. Do you know what I mean? Or yeah. when we say wake them up, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm like your dad. I, I don't suffer fools. And I am very, very extreme. And I can't, it's very hard for me to talk to someone who's an idiot, who's, who's walking around struggling up the street with a mask. I, I find it really hard. I cannot find the love in myself. So do you have that? Do you have that edge? Well, I know people can go up to someone and they can start to talk to them. And, and when they throw at them, oh, a million people died of COVID, the media told me, a mask, yada, yada. Um, I can't have a conversation with them after that. I have to, okay, goodbye. And I yeah. think that's and I probably mean. similar, isn't he? Yeah, it's, I know what you mean. accept that. But I think... For me, this is what I do anyway. So, like, I, I don't like to preach. Um, you know, if I'm if I'm at an event, I'll stand up and I'll speak. But if on on the day to day, um, if I'm you know stood next to someone in a shop or whatever, um, I will just tend tend to just engage in conversation, um, which is you know what I did anyway. To be fair, and I, and then I just I, I, t I tend to kind of just point out facts and and then you know ask them questions about it and and because. The whole COVID narrative is is so ridiculous. You know, it's so ridiculous that the only way that you could believe it, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And the only reason you could believe it <laughs> is is if you've not actually really paid attention to it. That's the only way, I, I believe anyway, that you can that you can, you know, go along with this whole nonsense is if you've not really looked into it or, or thought critically in any way. So I then just ask questions and I I went to Alton Towers at the weekend, um, for my daughter's birthday. Um, the birthday was back in June and we booked it, but obviously it was all locked down. So they, they moved the dates and we went last weekend and it was great. We went to CBB's land and just did all the, you know, kiddie stuff. And so when we're in the queues, like the kids just playing together or whatever, and I just ended up just in conversation with the parents of, you know, different kiddies. And I was saying, just saying things, you know, about this and about that. And I talk about the PCR test and about the fact they use 45 cycles when it only needs 10 cycles to show up a virus. Why would they, why would they do that? It's going to show up loads of uh, false positives, and just just make and you can just see people going. Ah, it's weird, actually, isn't it? That's is true. That is weird. I'd never even thought of that. And you're like, right, okay, well, you might go away now, and when you know your uncle, who's a bedwetter, says, well, look, Karen, blah blah blah, you might go, well, actually, they're using forty-five cycles instead of ten, and then he might go, what do you mean? And then there's a conversation, and so yeah. I find myself doing it like that because I, I know what I'm like. If someone preaches at me, I'm like, all right, mate, all right. I'm stood, yeah. in a, I'm stood in a queue with my daughter. Like, don't preach at me. Um, so I thought if you just have a conversation, like I had it um, not long ago, the other week, I went down to, um, there's a big queue outside Tesco's and I just could not be bothered with that queue. So I was outside. Like, oh, I won't go mm -hmm. to Tesco's today. I'll just go and buy like a little falafel wrap from this guy who runs a stall. <laughs> and so I ended up just chatting to him and I did the same thing. It was like, it's weird, isn't it? See, they've shut down Greater Manchester. He was like, yeah. Was like, but the test isn't testing for the virus, though. So I don't... And he was there going, is it not? And I was going, no, no, the guy that invented it said that it shouldn't be used. Why are they using it then? Well, exactly. And it ended up just a conversation. <laughs> and, and then I took my fluffle wrap and I, I you know, went yeah. off. And then every time I go back now, he's like, how are you? Still getting mad, isn't it? Yeah. Blah, blah. And he, now he's saying things to me now. He's like, yeah, I was reading this thing, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, oh, so you've gone away and you've actually researched. And I've not preached it yet. I've not been an annoying. I've just sort of said, it's weird, isn't it? And, um, and I think that's one way of doing it. You know, because because right. like, like we're saying, like you you said the same. It's it's so silly the narrative mm. that the only reason people can buy it is because they've not looked into it. It's the only way. 
How, you know, why is it so stupid? <laughs> I mean, you've got different theories. So people are saying that Boris is actually working for the good and he's got to confuse as many people as possible in order to wake them up. He's got to make it like, it's like 40 hours. It is. It, it's literally like a bunch of nincompoop lunatics, like Monty Python. We are, we're living in Monty Python because none of it makes sense as people can see that. You know, you go into a shop and there's loads and loads of people. I never, ever wear a mask. Never. It's a good way to meet friends, by the way. You make new friends. You go up to them, you have a hug in front of everyone. Everybody else is wearing masks. They look at you as if they're so sad. But everybody's coming into the shop and none of the shopkeepers are wearing masks. And yet all these hundreds and hundreds of people, and you look at them, you say, why are you not wearing a mask? And they say, they, 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 just, they just look at you. And, oh, the government said I don't have to. And then you prove to them that the government said face coverings, which is a scarf. It could be this. It could be a face covering. The government never said mass, and you actually explained to them the reason is because you can't go back to them and claim liability if you get sick, but they're in another world. It's like they've been entranced, you know, like someone put some kind of spell on them. That's the only way I can explain it. Yeah, yeah. I think, I, think that's, I think that's exactly what it is. I think that's exactly what it is. I think that there has been a spell put on people. And, and I think I think the establishment has very little respect for the human race. I think it thinks that humans are morons. And actually, you know, when you can say on the 23rd of March, we're locking down for two, three weeks, and we're now, you know, getting towards, you know, gone, you know, towards the end of September, then, you know, they're probably right that people just put up with rubbish. That doesn't make any sense. Are, um, they just, are they just, sorry, are they just bumbling idiots that, that have basically screwed themselves up because of all of this? Or is there an agenda? Is it an agenda that's literally leading to the new world order, like your dad says? Is it just leading us to Nazi Germany again? I think 100%. I, th I think Boris plays the, the role of bumbling idiot very, very, very well. Um, because a bumbling idiot is sort of, you know, hmm, he's quite, he's not threatening really because he's just a bumbling idiot. I don't think he's a bumbling idiot at all. I think he's a very intelligent man. I think he's a very driven man. I think he's a very cutthroat man um, who knows what he wants and he knows how to get it. And that's how he's, he's prime minister history. of this country. So yeah. he's got a history of paedophilia, hasn't he? Um, I don't know. I don't I, know. I, I thought you were going to say eugenics then, because I know he's got a history yeah. of eugenics with his father. He wrote a book on eugenics, yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So here's the big question. What do you think about Trump? I mean, I, I have a, a lot of trust in Trump, but, but he's human. He's human. I have seen the way he ended wars and how all the sex trafficking is coming up. So, you, uh, you know, you do have to give him some credit. But he's a human being. And I personally feel that even Trump, Q, all of this movement, it's not about them. It's about us. It's about us coming together. Where we go on, we go all. It's about us waking up. It's about the human race saving themselves. Because, you know, they do say God, God helps those that help themselves. So anyway, how do you feel about Trump? That's, that's my issue with the Q movement. And, and, and it's, it's the trust the plan. Because to me, trust the plan reads like, don't do anything, because just trust that someone else is going to sort it. Um, and I'm suspicious of that. I agree with you. I think we need to sort it ourselves. I don't, I don't, I don't trust the plan that anyone's going to sort anything. Um, it just it kind of, yeah, that, that's what I get from it. I don't trust Trump. I never have. Um, I also don't think that he's, the, you know, the demon and... Um, you know, Obama is, you know, the savior and all that sort of nonsense. I, I, I don't like either side of politics, whether it be in this country or, or any other country. I, I, I think, I don't think that you become president unless you are in the club or at least involved in the club. Cause I don't think you're allowed to, um, you know, right. and, 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 and the thing for him as well, like my, my jury was out with Trump the whole time. He was kind of like, well, I'm just going to wait and see. I'm going to wait and see. Yeah. And, and, and a big thing for me was when he named 
um, you know, his his backroom staff, basically. It was like, well, wait, and we'll see. And if he started putting alternative people in there, then it might have been like, hang on, okay, this could be interesting. But, you know, he was giving stuff to, you know, to Wilbur Ross and Sheldon Adelson. And then he, you know, when he gave the Federal Reserve to, to um, Goldman Sachs, and it's like, oh, mate, these are, mm. these, are all, these are all the same demons that all the others were having, you know, okay. um, you know, Mad Doc Mattis and all these people, they're, they're all the same people. And um, mm. so that, that, then that was me done really with him. But I'd okay. love to be proved, I'd love to be proved wrong. That would be yes. an absolute dream. Yes. If he, if he turns out to be the savior, then I'll buy him a pint and I'll be all over it. I don't but. believe he's the savior, but I do believe that he, that he's part of it. And the Q movement. And I, I mean, Obama was involved with Pizzagate and all of that. You know, let's not go into all of that. And uh, they're complete lunatics and satans. But I believe that Trump was placed. This is my own feelings. I think he was placed in order to break it apart. If you look at, we were talking about people like us, the star seeds. I was placed in Israel. I was in the Israeli army. I was placed in the Israeli army. You know, it's not my consciousness but it helped me to understand what's wrong with the world. So that's how I see it. And um, I, I really hope that, that he is a good man. I mean, I have watched him in church, talking in church about uh, taking care of the kids and making sure that every child is looked after. And, but like you, we can't live like this. We don't really want to have a system where there are leaders or anybody better than us. We don't want, I mean, you've got all of this new stuff with Gregory, you know, the, the new king and all of this. And he sounds like a really nice person. He sounds like he's done a lot of research. But, you know, as I said, we don't want that. We have to take responsibility for the human race. We have to run our own lives, you know, like communes, things like that. I, we have to have equality. But as I said, you're always going to get egos. And we have to work on our egos. We have to work on, on understanding that we all have a past and we all come from different places and different directions. We've come from different uh, agendas. But the most important thing is that that can't matter anymore. You know, you're always going to have people like I'm a Leo. I'm a massive Leo. And I fall out with everyone because I'm so powerful. <laughs> and, uh, they used to call me the ego has landed when I ran theater until I went into the therapeutic community and I understood that people and love is more important. And so that, that's what I want to see. I want to see a system based on love, compassion, sharing, bartering, bartering our skills. So you can perform anywhere. You don't need money for theaters. You know, everything is shared. We share it all. We share our world. And so, yeah, it's just been an incredible interview with you, Gareth. I mean, how do you feel about, um, obviously, the, you know, all these vaccinations and everything? Just, just chatting, obviously. It, we don't need it because we need to learn how to heal our bodies, our immune systems. That's what I believe anyway. So yeah, well, yeah. We, we, the answer. Well, well, not Bill Gates' vaccine, for a start. Um, you know, he, he's he, the guy's a demon. Um, and even if you believe, you know, strongly in, in vaccinations and what they do and stuff, and you're an absolute pro-vaxxer, you know, whatever, then, you know, these vaccines take, you know, between eight to 15 years, if not more, to develop. Um, they've never developed one for a coronavirus in the history, yet this has been knocked up and we're supposed to stick it in every single man, woman and child on the planet. Like, that's... For, for, for a disease, for a virus, even if you believe the narrative, that it is a threat to 0.004% of people that get it. Um, so, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't add up. So I think what they'll try and do, because I, I, I don't think they're going to try and just yet, you know, hold everyone down and stick it in their arm. But I think what they'll try and do is just make it virtually impossible to live without having it so you can't you can't travel so you can't go on airplane you can't go back to work you can't do this you can't do that um so people will just go oh for god's sake just okay i'll have it you know just to have my life back which is the worst possible thing people can do exactly um and it might just come down to like you said earlier like communes and i'm fine with that you know like if we just get a load of like-minded people a few hundred people 
on a plot of land. We'll all grow our own food. Mm. I'm fine. I'm absolutely fine with that. I'd rather, I'd rather my little one grow up climbing trees and planting food yeah. than, than playing with, you know, an Xbox anyway. So that's Wonderful. fine. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. I mean, I've got my own little allotments and that growing stuff. And quite honestly, the whole of this area, there's so many empty houses that, you know, at some point people are living on the street homeless, which is unbelievable. And, uh, you know, there are, I'm sure that people are going to start doing something. But as, I'm, as I say, I'm all about solutions. So I want to end with a positive I want to end with the positive. So what you, you were highlighting the worst case scenario and we're waking up. We're waking up. We're waking up and we're going all over the place and we're showing that this is not how we want to live. And so I want to believe that it won't get to that level, that there will possibly, they will bring out this vaccination and those that want it will have it and those that will be, I hope the majority will not have it. And therefore they will not be able to control our travel or anything like that. So what else can we do? Do you think there's anything we, else we can do in order to create more solutions and any more ideas? I mean, I've been talking to people that are saying, again, you gotta understand, I grew up in a war zone. I grew up with armies. Now armies never put out a poster if you know where I'm going, to tell you that we're all meeting up. Armies have strategies. Armies do everything at night and secretly, <laughs> and they win wars. Think about it. They win wars. And so sometimes I think that we may need to do something, not violence, but you don't need violence. You don't need violence. You just need common sense. And we might need to do something without actually going out and broadcasting it so that everybody knows, particularly the police, and that they're waiting for us. Would you, do you know where I'm coming from here? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I think the answer is, is just non-compliance. That's the simple answer because there's so many of us. Um, and so at the moment, I think we're in a position where it's just trying to wake enough people up and just trying to push out enough stuff and just make the point to people, you know, whether it be the, the guy with the falafel van or whatever, just just to try and, you know, because that guy that runs that falafel van, he's not going to get the COVID vax now, no chance. But he might well have done um, before, you know, he went and looked at stuff. Um, and so, you know, that's that's one more person, right? We'll take them off. And if, if, if we can do that with more and more people, like the, the London protest was 600 people, the next one was 35,000. I mean, that's a hell of a jump. And if these jumps, like when I did the Sheffield one, I was told, oh, they need all the help they can get. They're only getting about 20 people. Well, it was about 400. So it's just jumping and it's jumping yeah. and it's jumping yeah. each time. And so the more people that wake up, I get it off loads of people, private messaging me, friends I went to school with going, I've, I've just realized this is nonsense, isn't it? It's like, yeah, it's nonsense. Yeah. yeah. So, so now they won't get the vax. And so it's a case yeah. of, you know, like you say, if there's enough of us, they can't impose it because you can't yeah. say to two thirds of the world population, you can't travel. Okay. You know, you, you can't do that. Not, not long term anyway. Mm, mm. You know, so that's what people need to do. People yeah. just need to get on. And when they lock us all down again, I'm not, I don't know about you, but I'm not getting it's locked not down. It's not going to happen. <laughs> no, no one's locking me down. It's yeah. not happening. No, no I'm not. No one ever locked me down. I was out of my allotment all the time, growing fruit. And no, we just, in the beginning, there was a little bit of fear of hugging the occasional person, but most of the time. But they have created a big loneliness problem in this country through this as well as other stuff i mean i live on my own and there's times when i don't have any family and it's me all the time me on my own but you have to learn you have to develop your your through meditation and you have to really learn that that's part of the process of of learning how to be on your own but i i don't want to see this going on for much longer I think it's going to be really detrimental. But on the other hand, the longer it goes on, I really believe that these people, one of the things I believe is that they're jealous of us, what this thing rather than people, they're jealous of us because we have common sense and we have light, we have love. And they think they don't, they don't. And I know a lot of the time Liz Crokin and people go around saying these people are stupid. They are stupid. They, they have very, 
the, the brains are very sort of technological, let's face it. But there's no common sense. No. The more they do this, the more they're going to shoot themselves in the foot and we're going to win. Well, Gareth, we have no choice. I mean, you Oh, no, 100%. 100%, 100% we're going to win. 100% we're going to win. Year, you've got a two-year-old little girl. I don't have kids. I don't have family. But I feel I'm doing this for every single child and, you know, every single vulnerable human and every single child because humanity has to win. We have no choice. And so, you know, with your little girl, I mean, are you, she's two years old. So I presume she can't go to nursery or anything like that at the moment. Or? Well, she, she, she went back to nursery um, for a couple right. of days, um, which was quite a traumatic experience, to be honest, because all the kids were all upset because they've all been stuck in their houses for six months and, and not, you know, going to nursery. So yeah. psychologically damaged. But um, yeah, she got a runny nose because she's two. And that's what happens when kids go back to nursery. Normal. Yeah, normal. Yeah. So we were basically told that, yeah, she can come back. But obviously, because she's got a runny nose, um, she'll have to have a COVID test to test negative before she can join back. So we were like, right, well, not coming back then. So um, but this is just, you know. it's just insane. I mean, don't people realize that children get sick all the time and it's coming up to the winter. They have colds and coughs and sniffles. Only that, I mean, I've interviewed doctors. I've, do I've interviewed quite a few doctors, Dr. Jensen, Dr. Urzo, Dr. Adil. And we talked about women. Women's temperature fluctuates all over the place. And yet, of course, they've used that one. They've used that one because they messed up our thyroids. They messed up the thyroid through all the chemicals and the water and the fluoride. And now they're using that, the temperature thing. But I mean, surely people, every, you know, I don't get it how people don't say, but every child gets sick. We know this. It's a regular thing. Yeah. Our kids always got bits of colds and it just, it's like we landed in, in, on a different planet suddenly we're literally common sense went out the window and we're bringing it back. So let's hope that people are able to come back and not all of them will come back. Not all of them will come back and we will lose a lot of people through this, but we will save humanity and every war, unfortunately, has sacrifices and there's really nothing you can do sometimes. There's nothing you can do, nothing. No. No. I went out into the public garage to test something that I found out about the do not resuscitate. Um, smokers, 45 years old, smokers and obese people. I went out to the public and I confronted a, a public member and I thought this person would say that's outrageous. And yet they said to me, yeah, they're a drain on the, com uh, on the country. We need to let them go, yada, yada. I thought, hang on a second. Does your dad actually talk about people being born without souls? Because to me, that was a soulless human being. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's about 8%, isn't it? 8% of the population is, is a psychopath. I'm sure it's about 8%, something like that. But we're just born like, without a soul. Yeah, well, just, just a psychopath. I mean, it, that, 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 that person you've spoke to there... Like, I, that would be the first thing I'd say to them. You do realize what you've just said is insane. You do realize you're mental. That's, 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 a, that's a horrific thing to say. How can you and say to that think, about a human? I know, that's it, How isn't it? You said about yeah. an animal. I mean, you don't just... No. An animal no. down just like that. But oh. Anyway, they, it, as I say, it's gone way beyond, way beyond. I'm getting... I had someone call me the, yesterday. She's left the police force. She's amazing. She's not brave enough yet to get out there and to talk but i i do feel for them i do feel for the ordinary uh, people on the front line like police force and but i but i don't understand how a nurse or a doctor can keep quiet and go along with this and just because they're going to lose their job i'm sorry but i think every single gp needs to be sacked i think that i don't think we need gps anymore what, what do we need gps for we can, well, they, but they don't see you anyway. <laughs> pardon? They don't see you anyway anymore. Exactly. So why are they being paid? Are they being paid 
by the NHS or something? Because we need to end that. I mean, yeah. it's totally useless. You and I know everything about our body. We know how to, uh, to prevent and heal everything. And, and to try not to get to the level of a heart attack, even if you break a bone. And I broke my leg uh, a couple of years ago. I didn't have an operation. I had a cast. And now I can do anything. The doctor told me I'd never walk again, of course. And I was in a wheelchair for four months, a bit like, you know, when you were a kid. And that's a time when you're in a wheelchair, you notice how cruel people can be. You, you just disappear. It's like, you know, people don't want to look at you at all. But you can actually make a cast now. Go on YouTube and you can make your own cast. <laughs> you can heal anything. Mother Nature gave us everything. So on a positive note, is there anything else you'd like to say to give us some more hope so that we can end this? Because this has been an absolutely incredible interview. I'm, I'm honored. I'm honored to be able to interview you um, with the wisdom and to give you the respect that I know you're not going to get from that lot. Um, so is there anything else you'd, you'd like to say, Gareth, before we end? Um, well, thank you for having me for one. It's been lovely. Um, but just that we're going to win it. And, and I, you know, I'm not just saying that for effect. I honestly believe like with every single ounce of me that we're going to win it. And I think we're coming up now to a real critical point, which is this three week window, which I keep going on about where furlough ends in October. So at the moment, you know, there's people like us and lots of others as well, to be fair, that are vocal. And there's lots of others that agree with us that are less vocal because, you know, I don't want to get any grief or whatever. Um, but then there's this massive majority of people that know that something's up, but it isn't affecting them yet. So they're getting their furlough payments. They're getting 8% of their wages. They're sat at home. They don't have to pay to get to work. They don't have to buy the lunch at work. So actually, even though it's only 80% of their wages, they're sometimes even, you know, earning more money by not going to work because they don't <laughs> have the out outgoings a friend of mine. It costs him nine grand a year to get to work. So he doesn't have to pay that obviously. Um, so, um, so that furlough ends and so all of a sudden those people that are now you know kind of you know watching netflix kind of enjoying it a little bit are going to be put in a position where well there's no more money coming in and you're getting locked down again there's no work there's that desperate point then where all of a sudden there's a large large number of people in the population that have got nothing left to lose and they're 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 the one person or the one group of people you don't want to fight it's people that have got nothing left to lose. Um, and there's going to be a lot of those people. And so, Oh you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're going to come on our side. You've got, you've got the free, you've got different groups here. It's all about the bit in the middle. It's like Buddhism. You've got to find that bit in the middle. You've got one group that wants to guillotine everybody. And then you're going to end up with the French revolution. You know what came after that. And then you've got the other group that just want to sit there and meditate and send love and light to everyone, which is like, you know, once someone's harmed a child, they're like a rabid dog and you don't want them in society. They're gone, finished. Um, so you've got to find that bit in the middle. You've got to find the common sense in order to be able to move on from this and to create, as I say, a beautiful society. Do you, do you know anything about Nasara and Gisara? those terms of the new systems, Nassara and Gassara. Now, is, is that the, like the destroyers and the creators? No, no, no. Or, it's no. a new, a new system of global resets, a positive one. Right. And global, where if you, every country has to sign up for it. And if you try to start a war, you actually get defunded. Charlie Ward talks a lot about it. I don't know if you watch him. And also, um, there's quite Charlie Freak. There's quite a lot of people that are talking about it. There's groups on, on Facebook. And it sounds like if you're a humanitarian, which is good for me and good for you, you know, you're likely to get grants. Because up until now, yeah, I did get a lottery grant uh, to write my musical um, because I could never get anything up until this um, lockdown. So there's some silver lining. But they usually make you jump through so many hoops and here, there and everywhere. Um, anyway, it's been incredible, Gareth. Oh, it's been lovely. Thank you. And I'll talk to you again. I'm I so hope. excited. I'm sure. And uh, I shall see you on the 26th. I'll be filming. Oh, fabulous. Fabulous. Yeah. I'll see you then. <laughs> I've asked Pierce if I can sing Pia Yezu because I've got this theory, as I said to you, like James Twyman, the troubadour of peace, that the police all gather around us. 
we bring everybody back to God, to love, by doing a meditation, closing our eyes and doing a meditation as we're walking down to Downing Street. I personally feel that if we do that, no one will get arrested. So I'm, I hope to be able to try that out. I'm going to try it on the 19th when everybody finishes talking and we'll see what happens. I'd be oh, fab. to meet you in person again and hope yes. to get you down to um, Marlow, get you down to Marlow to doing a talk. Oh yeah, very quickly before you go, do you need any um, permissions, you know, usually uh, public liability and all that nonsense to do any of these talks at all? Or are we, I mean, that's... I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure because I've never organised one. I just sort of turn up. But turn up. I'm pretty sure when it comes to a political protest, which is obviously what exactly what this is, um, that there's laws to protect that. I think, but I'd, but I'd look, I'd, uh, yeah, well, I'd ask Piers, he's the, he's the man, isn't he? I'll ask him, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, it's, as I say, it's been amazing. I hope you have a beautiful day. The sun is absolutely everywhere here in High Wycombe, so you'll have to come and visit us. That uh, sounds lovely, yeah. Could do with come some of that here. some beetroots and spinach and things like that. Lovely jubbly. Have a beautiful day. It's been amazing and lots of love, Gareth. Take care now. Take care, thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Wow. I loved that interview. I don't know about you, but I just thought that Gareth is an amazing, amazing freedom fighter, um, holistic, unique man. Believes we're going to win, and that's what we need on Moving On TV. So welcome to the Lauren Hope Glory Show. And please enjoy this interview. Come on Moving On TV with your positive stories, with your positive ideas. We have to win this. We have no choice, guys. And there's no point falling out with me if I say that 1% of me says that Trump is not what he says he is or what you think he is. It doesn't matter. All we care about is we come together and we save humanity together from something very, very evil, something very dark that does not have any empathy or love that has tried to end us, humanity, the beautiful human race that we are. All right? So there you go. So um, join the petition, start your own, come to mine. <laughs> come to mine on the uh, 20th. Higginson Park in Marlowe, singing, and anybody who turns up can sing, perform, talk, and we will carry on waking up people, slowly, slowly, or in big groups, whatever happens. And if and when that lockdown comes, go out there and do the opposite. Celebrate your freedom and know that this is just a massive hoax. I love you lots. Contact me at movingontv1 at gmail.com. Please subscribe, share, and like. Take care now. Bye. A flower, a flower. She's all around. She lights up the room. Turns to love.